So Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Well, thanks very much, Pete, and good morning to you. My name is Orlando. If you don't know who I am, that's it. Uh, I work uh, alongside Pete and a number of others on the staff here at Christ Church, and it's my privilege this morning to lead our reflections on this topic, um, which is this term's big issue. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we've just been reading those amazing words from Psalm number eight, reminding us of that lofty dignity, the place that you've given to human beings within and above other parts of your creation. We've seen a reflection of that, I guess, even in the images we were watching earlier, the technology, the ingenuity that led to the capability of presenting the world to us in that way. And our prayer this morning is that you'd teach us, remind us, perhaps even rebuke us as we seek to live as those who are made in creation, but also over creation. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, look, the Greta Thunberg story is truly extraordinary, isn't it, if that's how you pronounce her name? One day last August, this introverted 15-year-old Swedish schoolgirl decided to skip school and instead sat rather pathetically outside the parliament building in Stockholm with a handmade banner saying school strike for climate. But within a matter of weeks, that solo protest had turned into a movement galvanized into action by her example, something like two million students in 125 countries decided to join a school strike in May this year, including many here in Southampton. She's addressed the UN climate talks in Poland. She's given a tongue lashing to the billionaires of the world at Davos. She's spoken to the UK parliament and the European parliament. She's been on the front cover of Time magazine She's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And in the process of all this, she's become an inspiration for the Extinction Rebellion movement, which also began last summer and has been engaged in very high profile acts of civil disobedience in London and elsewhere ever since. Half a million Londoners were affected by the actions in April Maybe some of us were caught up in the transport disruptions as well. And yet here's the extraordinary thing. Despite the chaos they caused, half of Londoners still said they supported the protests. In the last three months, in the wake of Greta Thunberg's visit to Parliament and the actions of Extinction Rebellion, public concern about the environment has skyrocketed. 
these uh, protests of theirs highlighting the complacency of governments about the environmental threat have clearly struck a chord. The question is why? Well, David Attenborough's helped, I guess, with his warnings heard by millions about the effects of plastic waste on fish stocks and his pictures of bleached coral reefs and, and so on. Weather reports over the last few weeks showing freak heat waves in France and even Alaska. That's got many of us scratching our heads. And actually, just the raw statistics are fairly confronting. The UK Committee on Climate Change issued its latest report this week saying it would now be prudent to prepare for a four degree rise in global temperatures, which I understand would mean sea levels rising by 10 meters, coastal cities around the world being obliterated, 300 million climate refugees, epidemic disease would be a certainty, famine, no question. Resource wars, likely. It's all pretty eye-watering stuff. It's hardly a surprise that public concern has risen so much. What's more surprising for us, perhaps, is why many Christians seem to be less anxious and less activist on these issues than those around them. Why might that be? And let me suggest three possible reasons. One is the, well, frankly, the spiritual tendencies of the environmental movement, historically at least. In ancient Greece, the goddess Gaia was the ultimate earth goddess. All life came from her. She was the embodiment of the living world itself and therefore to be worshipped alongside the other gods. Now, not many people today in the UK worship Gaia. There are some who do, but uh, neo-paganism is not a big thing. New age is not the force it was. What is big, though, is the growing tendency to think of planet Earth, our environment, as the most important thing there is, the ultimate sustainer of life. And therefore, to think of looking after it, serving its needs better, as the primary responsibility of human beings. For many people, especially younger people, our greatest moral responsibility is to care for our environment. And the Bible has a word for that. It's idolatry. Idolatry. Making anything other than God, even if it's something wonderful that's been made by God, the ultimate priority is strongly condemned in the Bible. Remember why God's wrath is being revealed in Romans chapter one? It's because they worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. See, for many, environmental concern really has become a form of idolatry and quite understandably, Christians don't want to go anywhere near that. That's one reason I think Christians might be cautious here. And there's a second, which is a key thing, particularly in some parts of the Christian world. It is the political associations of the environmental movement. If lines are drawn in your nation's political life in such a way that to care about the environment looks like jumping into bed with people who want to liberalize abortion laws even further, something you're opposed to, and impede free market economies, which maybe you think is a bad idea, and encourage people to express their identity in ways that the Bible says is harmful for them and for society, then clearly you're gonna think twice. It's gonna be incredibly difficult to step back and think about responsibilities towards creation when in your context that means identifying with people who seem just beyond the pale. And how does the book of Psalms begin? 
Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the one who what? Does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Spiritual tendencies, political associations, and one third reason I think Christians might be cautious in this area, theological confusion. Imagine for a moment a young Christian decides to research this area, goes on the internet, uh, trying to make sense of his or her responsibilities towards the world. What is he or she going to stumble across there as he or she clicks away? I look at the, uh, uh, some ministry websites, perhaps. One says, we're here to be humble stewards of the earth's resources, treading lightly on God's world. Another says, no, read the Bible. It says human beings are to rule over creation, to have dominion over it, to subdue it. Well, which is it? He listens to a couple of online sermons. One older preacher says, uh, this world is on the way out. It's going to be burned up and replaced. So why waste time and energy and resources investing in something that is clearly on its way out? Doesn't feature in God's eternal plans in any way. A couple of clicks later, he's listening to a younger preacher. The best human accomplishments would endure into the new creation, says this one. What you do in and for this world could continue into eternity. Well, again, which is it? He tries some blogs. One says, remember, human beings are just the dust of the earth. That's what we're made from. That's what we'll return to. We're just one more detail in God's creation. Another says, remember, human beings have the breath of God in them. They're a breed totally apart from the rest of creation. Well, again, which is it? With all this theological confusion, you can see why many Christians are left just paralyzed not knowing what to think. So what should we think? Well, we can't uh, do anything more this morning than scrape the surface of this issue, but we do have this question here for us. What would Jesus say to Extinction Rebellion? By which I don't mean I want to get into questions of civil disobedience and those kind of things, but perhaps the broader question is key for us. How does the Bible speak into these areas of use and abuse of what is around us. Let me suggest three steers that we're given. The first is this, affirm that which God affirms. Affirm that which God affirms. From beginning to end, God presents himself in the Bible as being thoroughly pro-creation as a whole. You see that right at the start, in the rhythm of Genesis chapter one, we get that repeated statement from God as he speaks the world into being. Each day he looks down on the latest stage of his creation and gives his verdict, day one, light. And God saw that it was good. Day two, sky and sea, and God saw that it was good. Day three, plant life, it was good. Day four, day five, day six, with, with, with mammals and human beings, it was, it was very good, which is not to say, by the way, that human beings are better than what came before. No, it's very good because this time, the, the last verse of Genesis 1, if you've got it there, God looks at everything he's made and it was very good. It is the completeness of God's creation which God affirms. If you know the M5 motorway south of Bristol, you'll be aware 
that there's a long split level section. When it was built 50 years ago, it was said to be one of the greatest modern day engineering feats in the country. And apparently the man behind it, the engineer, was so pleased with it that he built himself a house from which he could look over his greatest achievement every day of his retirement. Well, whatever floats your boat, I suppose. But, but actually, it's, it's something like that here, isn't it? As God looks over his creation, I made this, and it is very good. God glories in his creation. And that concern for non-human creation is there again and again in the Bible. When animals get hungry, it's okay, because every green plant is given to them by God to eat. Genesis 1, verse 30. That is, God designs creation to operate not just for the benefit of human beings, but for the animals too. When Noah went into the ark, God sent him with species after species, pairs of animals, birds, insects of every kind. Genesis 6, verse 20. It seems the whole variety, the diversity of different species is deliberately preserved into the new uh, post-flood era. When Noah came out of the ark, God gave that sign of the rainbow as a sign of his promise, his covenant. But whatever your children's Bibles back home might say, that covenant was not between God and people. No. It was between God and every living creature. Four times that is made clear. Genesis 9 verse 12 in that paragraph there. God is establishing a, a covenant between himself and all life on the earth. Very striking. Now when Job confronts God and he, he, he's put in, to, in his place by God, and God talks about how, unlike Job, he, he's looking after every aspect of creation. This is Job 39. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Does the eagle soar at your command? And so on. He's concerned. And even though the new creation really will be a new creation, even then... God is concerned about the material environment for his people. In Revelation 22, we're told of the river of the water of life. On each side of the river stands the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees, we're told, are for the healing of the nations. God is enmeshing human beings for eternity in a material, created world. God affirms his creation. And quite naturally, he expects us to do likewise. Well, that should be obvious, I suppose. We try to take our lead from God in everything, don't we? We try to develop God's mind and make it our mind. My friend's friend is my friend. What my God values, I will value. It's just implicit. But every now and then it becomes explicit as well. You get these little snippets throughout the scriptures that, that, that it's brought into focus from time to time. So in the Old Testament, for example, when Israel went to war and besieged a city, they're told, interestingly, not to cut down trees if they can avoid it. This is Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 19. Are the trees humans, says God, that you should cut them down? Even war, apparently, doesn't justify environmental destruction. And in the New Testament, when a mishap occurs, Jesus takes it for granted that his people will go to the aid of an animal. This is Matthew 12, verse 11. If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, how do you think that sentence might end? Roast lamb for dinner? Woolly jumpers all round for the winter? No, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? 
Yeah, you see the point. God is affirming his non-human creation in all its unnecessary variety and spectacular color and extraordinary design. And he expects us to affirm it too. It's interesting when you watch those wildlife programs like the Planet Earth 2, one that the, we saw the trader for earlier on. Uh, What's interesting is they tell us, uh, they, they highlight various species that are on the verge of destruction. And, uh, well, I don't know about you, but I, I tend to react most, and I think they know this, when it's either a big, handsome animal, like a tiger, or a panda, or a gorilla, or else it's one that has obvious repercussions for human beings, like the bee shortage. But what am I doing when I react that way? Without thinking about it, I'm attaching value to those creatures, creatures simply because of what it does for me. It gives me something handsome to look at and appreciate, or something to eat. It seems to me lots of environmental campaigners operate on a frequency like that, but the Bible Christian attaches value and therefore perhaps mobilizes to help save his species even simply because God has deemed that creature valuable. He created, he sustains, he cares. Well, why wouldn't I? Or to put it another way, how about we just stop talking about the environment altogether? Stop it. Because calling it that makes it all about you, doesn't it? Whose environment is it that we're talking about here? It's ours. And certainly stop talking about nature as though it's just there of its own accord. Start calling it what it really is. God's creation. To be valued as he values it. And cared for as he cares for it. Affirm that which God affirms. Second, love those whom God loves. It's interesting, in the Bible, God seems to express his love in different ways. He loves his son, Jesus, in a way that he loved nobody else. Only the son has spent eternity with the father. He loves us, his individual children, in a way he doesn't love others. Only we get to call him father. He loves us as a church in a way that he doesn't love those beyond the church. Only we get to think of ourselves as the bride of Christ. But there is another sense in which he shows love to every human being. In Acts uh, chapter 14, the apostle Paul performs an extraordinary healing. And he and his companion Barnabas are immediately taken for gods. Who else could have done this extraordinary thing? Well, they're horrified by that, of course, and they quickly point the crowd to the true God. The true God, they say, has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. He does all that, says, says Paul, even for those who aren't his people. He does it for everyone. You don't need to flash your spiritual ID card God has designed this world to operate in such a way that unbelievers can get fed just the same as believers can. As God sees things, anybody who bears his image, that is every human being, is a worthy beneficiary of his kindness. So it's not surprising that this same God expects his people to show the same basic kindness to everyone around. Yes, we'll naturally have a, a deep level of love and concern for those who are our spiritual brothers and sisters. But when you see someone in need, what you're looking at is what? A neighbor to be loved. And that, of course, is the gist of the parable of the Good Samaritan. In Luke chapter 10, love your neighbor as yourself, says Jesus. Well, who is my neighbor? Asks the lawyer talking to him. Uh, your neighbor, says Jesus, is someone who by all social conventions looks like someone to be ignored or even worse. 
But because he is in real need, he is actually someone to be shown compassion. Go and do likewise, says Jesus. Go and be a neighbor to people like that, people in need, wherever you find them. Uh, When it comes to climate change in particular, two things have become very obvious. One, that it's rich people who cause it. The least developed 50 nations account for just 1% of greenhouse gas emissions. Europe and North America are disproportionate contributors. In fact, our wealth is built on our consumption of natural resources. And two, that it's poor people who will suffer for it. For example, those in sub-Saharan Africa. According to the UN, 99% of the casualties of global warming will be borne by developing countries. 99%. Malnutrition, water shortage, disease. Those who have least will suffer most. Now, I know the issues here are highly complex. There, are, there is still debate going on in some parts of the world about what causes what and what the links are and so on. But when push comes to shove, it seems to me here are neighbors of ours in our global village who are already down in the ditch, bleeding. Surely love requires us to take action and give relief rather than push them down even further. I don't know what that might mean in terms of our lifestyles, diets, consumption, general life choices, but love of neighbor must surely leave us at least asking a few straight questions, mustn't it? Love those whom God loves. And third, rule the way God rules. One of the key verses in the Bible on all these issues is Genesis chapter 1, Verse 26, you can look it up now if you've got your Bible there in front of you. Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. That word, Rule has caused all sorts of issues over the years. It's actually left some people convinced that Christianity is the problem when it comes to the environment, not part of the solution. Why? Well, because rule over sounds to some ears like exploit. Get what you can from it. Strip it bare if you want. Because, hey, you're in charge, you're the boss. But is that what ruling means in the Bible? Far from it. The most obvious rulers in the Bible were, I guess, the Old Testament kings. So they make a good study, perhaps, of what ruling means. Deuteronomy 17 introduces us to the rules for kings, what rule looks like for them. For example, they were to be restrained not accumulating horses or wives or wealth. They were to be listening. They had to write out the whole of God's law and then read it every day. They were to be humble, not considering themselves better than the people they ruled over. Do you see the point? To be a ruler in God's world is not to be exploitative, but serving Not domineering, but conscious of your place in the order of things. Which presumably is why when God sets Adam up in Eden, the brief is laid out as it is. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. He's given limits to the expression of his rule. God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you'll surely die. Clear brief with clear limits. 
Now, in one sense, God's rule is obviously very different to this kind of vice regent, steward kind of rule. He's ultimate, we're not. It really is all about him when it comes to his rule. But in the bigger picture, remember how God the Son responds and uses the authority that is rightly his. Philippians 2 verse 26, being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. The idea of rule then is shot through with ideas of service. And that serving rule is the kind of rule we as God's image bearers are given to exercise in our stewardship dominion of creation. Well, it's time to land. Five quick heart journeys that will be good for us to embark on, I think, that might or might not resonate with a typical Extinction Rebellion protester. First, move from entitlement to gratitude. Move from entitlement to gratitude. That psalm we read earlier on, Psalm 8, was a celebration of the lofty place God has given to humanity in the order of things. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. But it's worth remembering it's not all about us. That God has a relationship, a covenant in fact, with non-human life too. God loves the world, he glories in the world. That he gives us power and authority over the world is not a prompt to stake our claim, to claim our rights, but to nurture deep gratitude in our hearts to God for the dignity of that office he's given us. Second, move from selfishness to service. From selfishness to service. I take it everyone here is enjoying a lifestyle, me included, that effectively says to our global neighbors, I'm not changing things for you. Deal with it. Isn't that what we do, day by day? The question to be asked, whether that's consistent with the, with the command of Jesus to love our neighbor. It doesn't seem to resonate with God's command in Genesis 1. Being God's image bearers is not just about the present, you see. It's about the future. The command, you'll recall, Genesis 1 verse 28 is, fill the earth and subdue it. That is... Multiply, have babies, work for future generations. Which of course means not just procreating for them, but providing for them. Maybe we need to think more about serving them than serving ourselves. Third, move from isolation to partnership. That is, for all the questionable motivations of other parts of the environmental movement in their priorities for the earth, don't be afraid to make common cause with them in the outworkings. The rhetoric of Extinction Rebellion and other environmentalists may be tedious and panicked, but remember, God is on record for speaking to his people through a donkey just might be that God is showing us paths to faithful stewardship through their priorities and the things they're drawing attention to. Fourth, move from cynicism to responsibility. Move from cynicism to responsibility. So easy in this area to excuse inactivity, isn't it? And of course, that's what our sinful hearts always want to do. Will anything I do really make a difference? Is anything our country going to do really going to make a difference? 
Nobody else seems to be doing much. Other countries aren't taking their share of the load. Maybe we need to shape up to personal responsibility. Things do change, but they change one person at a time. Why not be ahead of the curve rather than the behind it? Sure, that will involve cost to us in some way. But if Christians can't swallow a bit of cost in the short term for the sake of others in the long term, well, what have we become? We need to step up. And fifth, move from fear to trust. The language of Extinction Rebellion and the wider environmental movement is shot through with panic about the future of our planet and our species. Even the name of the movement has that panic in it. And not surprisingly, if this planet becomes ultimate in your thinking, you will respond in the same way. Many of us have just picked it up particularly the younger members of our congregation here would have picked this up. It was in the air that we breathe, in the culture around us, that this planet, this species is ultimate. And therefore, fear will be endemic to a generation. If that is you, because for you the environment is all or nothing, I would love to sit down with you and talk to you about what it is to live for Jesus. With him is the ultimate thing in your life. Because that really does change everything, even the deepest perspectives on life. But that kind of fear really has no place for the Christian. The key signature of the Christian life is humble trust and dependence and hope, not fear and panic. It is possible to be activists in our behavior while being people of faith in our perspective and approach because it is God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is all and in all. Let's pray, shall we? Just a few moments to reflect on some of the material we've covered and the places we've been, and perhaps the implications for our thinking and for our lives. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Our Father, these issues we've touched on this morning would have hit raw nerves for some of us this morning. There's a level of guilt within us, there's a level of cynicism within others. There is confusion for many. There is irritation at the priorities of others for many of us too. I pray that we would be people of your word, that we wouldn't swallow wholesale the comments, the practices, and the attitudes of the panic of many around us, but that we would learn what it is to live humbly as stewards of yours, exercising rule and dominion in a way that's appropriate for your creatures. 
for Jesus' honor. Amen.